I mean. Afternoon, Baina. <laughs> to briefly review what we covered yesterday, we started talking about dispensationalism. The concept that God's instructions or instructions given during one portion of Earth's history can differ to those instructions giving, given in another portion of Earth's history. We discussed the two, two methods that we can use, repeat and enlarge. And progression. And then we took this model of progression and we took it to the question of diet. And the reason we went to diet is because everyone gets that. To some extent, even if we have differences in, um, small differences bet between each other, we understand this concept of progression when it comes to the diet uh, that we had at Eden, returning to the diet that we had at Eden before the second advent. So we went to a subject we all understand well. That there was the di diet of Eden that was perfect. And we understand that we will be returning to the diet of Eden at the end. So somewhere between Eden and our new Eden, everything went wrong. And we understand that um, our, our parents went into sin. And because of sin, everything changed and we went to Noah. And in the history of Noah, you have the flood, um, the history of the world before the flood, it was a, a, a scene of much wickedness. And then you have Noah um, and his family that are saved. And God goes to Noah and he says, I'm going to change your diet. Now I'm going to give you not just the original diet, now I'm going to give you animals to eat, flesh to eat. And Ellen White describes this in Councils on Diets and Foods 411.1. She says, I present the word of the Lord God of Israel. Because of transgression, the curse of God has come upon the earth itself and upon the cattle and upon all flesh. Again, I will refer to the diet question. We cannot now do as we have ventured to do in the past in regard to meat eating. It has always been a curse to the human family. So when it was given to Noah, at the very beginning, it was a curse. And here you have the introduction of eating animal flesh. Then we went to the history of Abraham. We don't go to the texts, but we know that he's the father of Israel and there's no change. He just practices what began with Noah. Then we went to the history of <coughs> the beginning of ancient Israel. And we find that it was just codified. That this curse was just written down so people would know how to practice this curse. From the time of the beginning of ancient Israel, we went to the time of the end of ancient Israel. And this is the history of the early church. And then we read in the history of the early church from Luke 24, 42 and 43. They gave Jesus fish to eat and honeycomb. A 
then you have Jesus eating flesh, flesh food. He is himself participating in that curse. From here we mark the book of Revelation, identifying that this is all that we have in Old and New Testament scripture regarding the question of diet. Then we come to the time of the Alpha history of modern Israel, the Millerites. And Ellen White starts to give instructions to, these, to, to, to the people that in the closing scenes of this earth's history, we have to return to the diet of Eden. But she says not all of that diet. It's just flesh that we should discard. We can still eat dairy products and eggs. So she's not actually condoning that we go back to the whole diet of Eden. She's just saying we should stop eating these flesh foods. What she does say is that while we should stop eating flesh foods, there is a more extreme diet. There's more an extreme form of this diet that advocates putting away milk, butter and eggs. And she says, when the time comes that we are to do this, God will reveal it. We are not to advocate extremes in health reform. And she's saying that the vegan diet is an extreme in health reform. So she does not here speak about, um, give a firm message against dairy and eggs, a, a firm message for the vegan diet. We come to the history of the 144,000 and we all seem to understand that in this history we already have to be going back to the Diet of Eden. And we're already prior even to our time of the end recognising as a church at least the, the, the conservative elements of that church that, that are actually following Ellen White's counsels, although inconsistently, they're recognising that that time for a vegan diet has arrived. We can identify that because of the reform line. So all that we've done is just take the question of diet and put it on a line of progression and seeing how in one dispensation we're told to eat meat, in another dispensation we're told how to eat meat, in another we witness Jesus eating meat, then we come to another dispensation and we're told you shouldn't eat meat but dairy and eggs don't be too strict and then we come to our own history and we are strict. All that we did was take this same concept of progression to, to two other studies. This is this is a study of diet and how diet has changed over time. Then we can go to a study of race. And we can see that in the history of Eden, there was equality. You come to the time of Noah and there is a curse, another curse. And there is inequality. You come to the history of Abraham and there is no change. Come to the history of Moses and slavery is codified into the laws of Moses, you come to the history of Christ and there begins to be this change where they, the disciples start having to teach Paul in a very strong fashion. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. You Jews might think you're special, but you've misunderstood those quotes and that day has certainly passed. So you start to see that, but you still see slavery within the book of Philemon. And even though it doesn't speak a great deal about slavery, we have the quotes in Ephesians chapter 6 that says, Slaves, submit unto your masters as unto the Lord. You certainly have had no statement condemning slavery. And then you come to the history of the Millerites and something starts to change. 
And slavery isn't just recognised to be a bad idea, it's recognised to be an extreme sin, worthy of the, the, the judgement of God. But she still is recognising that there is inequality. She hasn't yet dealt with all the inequality, even within the church. Then we come to our history. We can summarise it and say Obama. But even previous to this, back in here, with the civil rights movement, it's already recognised externally and by the faithful internally that there must be equality on every level. We did the same with gender. the very beginning there is equality. Then you have a sin, then you have inequality. You come to Abraham, no change. Covenant relationship with Abraham. Come into the laws of Moses and it's codified. A relationship of a woman to her husband and her family. The priesthood, everything about inequality between men and women is codified into law. You come to the history of Christ and you have the same thing. There begins to be baptism just like there begins to be a, a recognition of equality between Jew and Gentile. There begins to be a recognition of equality with male and female, with the practice of baptism, with how Jesus personally responded to women, but you still have 12 male disciples. There is still this inequality. And you have Ephesians chapter 5. You come to the history of the Millerites and there begins to be a change. You have Ellen White and you have strong statements she makes about the role women are to play in the church as teachers, as leaders receiving equal treatment, equal pay. But she still teaches inequality. You come down to the 144,000. You have Clinton and they're equal. And that wasn't just to happen now. It's already recognised as happening prior to the time of the end. We're all being required, whether we're priests, Levites or Nethanims, are all being required to begin this transition back to Eden. And on some of these issues, a firm stand has already been made. Diet question, already been made. When it comes to race, already been made. When it comes to gender, in the process of making that change now. <coughs> And when we talk about equality, like the question last night, I don't mean to embarrass anyone's questions, it's a good question. But when we talk about equality in different roles, what do we mean about equality? What is God teaching us about equality? When we come to someone like Hillary Clinton, was she supposed to be equal to her husband and then stay home and take care of her child? How is God demonstrating equality externally? She was to be the leader of the free world. That's politics. That's government. That is not her in a role at home raising a child. Not to belittle that. But this equality covers, covers every single level, whether it's home, whether it's church, or whether it's government, whether it's the ordination of women into the church, where it's women teaching, or whether, if you want the test of the Nethanims, which couple of billion people worldwide are failing right now. It was to recognise a woman at the level of government, at the highest level of government that this world has to offer. So we are returning to the original plan. And I don't find this subject of meat eating as being that different to the subject of race or gender. Because of sin, how much suffering was introduced into the world? It sounds kind of a little bit soft, but I don't think it is. When God knows every sparrow that falls, how do you think his heart breaks when he sees how many animals are mistreated and slaughtered every year for food? This is a line about the suffering that sin introduced into the animals that we were given to take care of. This is suffering into the different groups of people where we should have been caring for each other. This is suffering introduced into a marriage relationship where they were meant to originally to care for each other. Whether it's the treatment of animals, the treatment of different races or different genders, this is the suffering of sin that God is trying to eradicate. 
We went from here and we went to the lines of the 144,000. We speak about the 144,000. They are our overarching line, 1989 to 9-11. Sunday law. Close of probation. Second Advent. When we come to the priests, we bring them down and we see 1989, 9-11, 2014, 2019, Panium, 2014 being the Sunday law. And what begins at the Sunday law? From the language of Revelation 14, Sister Rispa, your lips moved. What begins at Revelation 14? At the Sunday law. Either one. The arrival of the third angel, yes. This is the arrival of the third angel. So this is the story that we started to construct. Now did we do a work in, in 2014? We actually did. Most of us, most people in the movement have come, out, come into this movement since 2014 because that was the beginning of a cry for us. There's no one else to give it but priests. So when we come to the 144,000, we know that there's a work here. But where is the, the, does the key work of the priests begin? Panium. At this point, they do the work of going to the Levites and harvesting them. They have a work to do after Panium. It's then that they are fitted for their job function. And we can take two different lines from the New Testament to demonstrate this. If we take one, we can take the line of Christ himself. 1989 to 2019 is how many years? This is 30 years. When he's 30, does he begin his, his work? Yes, but straight away? No. First of all, baptism. And then where does he go? Into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. So I'm just dropping this in here, but where are we? In the wilderness, what is Satan doing? Tempting us of the devil. What does that mean and look like? We need to know. <laughs> If you think this movement has some problems or struggles right now with issues that aren't being properly understood, maybe it's because we're in a period of temptation and there's three temptations we need to work our way through and pass. So he goes through that wilderness temptation through the marriage of Cana and he says at the marriage of Cana, my time has not yet come and then he comes and he cleanses the temple. Then he goes to work here. So we have one witness that Christ, from the life of Christ himself, this is when his key work begins. We can take the whole line of the end of ancient Israel and then what is this way, Mark? The end of ancient Israel, this becomes the cross. When do the disciples go to work? At the cross? No. They're scattered, they go back to their fishing boats and then they go through Pentecost and then they go to work. So we have multiple witnesses for this, that this is where we go to work. 
We talked back to the line of the 144,000 and identified similarly that if we're going to understand 6,000 years of progression after this fashion, there are going to be people of all different levels, of all different understandings of who and what God is, from those who don't even know he exists to those like Moses who have some understanding but has not witnessed this history of progression, has never never understood well he does now but I'll use someone else Aaron, Aaron had a priesthood a male priesthood, he's going to have to go to heaven after the second advent and get taught about equality whether you're whether they're Aaron or John the Baptist or someone living somewhere that never received the gospel but still lived up to the light they had, they're going to be, need to be taught here, taught by the 144,000 because the 144,000 and the priests are teachers. He that is greatest among you shall be the least. The 144,000 are the priests. They seem to be the greatest, but from them the most is required. The most that is required is a life of service. They become also the least. So we have this witness from the line of the priests connecting to the line of Christ that the 144,000 go to work after the second advent and their work is teaching. So when we come to this history of the priests and we're standing here, we have to understand who each of us is and what our job function is, what is required of us. Now there's a couple of things that become required of us. The midnight cry message of 2014 to 2019 This dispensation is the Sunday law test. If you were to bring it up here, you would call this the Sunday law test. So those who have failed and have fallen away in the last month, they have failed the Sunday law test. And what does Daniel 11.41 tell us? Daniel 11 verse 41 He shall enter also into the glorious land that's at the Sunday law he shall enter also into the United States at the Sunday law and many shall be overthrown that word countries is supplied so he enters into the glorious land and many shall be overthrown. If you are overthrown, what were you before? You're free. So you're free and then you're taken captive. Who is free in the history of the Sunday law? Is, Adventists, uh, is Adventism free in that history? So they're not free. We're calling people out of Babylon so everyone in Babylon isn't free. So who is the only people that are free in the history of the Sunday law? Priests. This movement. This movement is the only group that is free in the history of the Sunday law. And in the Sunday law, many of the movement are overthrown. And we've just witnessed that on a fractal level. That those who have left in this history are the many many shall be overthrown by the test of the Sunday law. And the test in this history is twofold. Back in 1989 to 9-11, what's the test? Say line upon line. Daniel 11. Could say line upon line, Daniel 11, 40 to 45. What else are you tested upon? Organisation. Can you listen to Elder Jeff Pippinger over your conference leadership? 
Can you recognize he who speaks for God and he who speaks for himself? Recognize a new leadership rising up. You come to this history of 9 11 to 2014. And what is the test? Time and organization. Can we recognize the leadership that God has put into place? When we come to this history of the midnight cry, what is the test? Equality and organization. I heard someone say conspiracy theories and I agree with that but I just want to clarify that point while we're on it as to how, how I see that. You have the truth and you have error. If I was to say the truth is equality and error is inequality, I might say the truth is Obama and error is Trump. Or I might say the truth is this movement, <laughs> the error is FFA. So the message is about equality. How do we come to these two different conclusions, equality, inequality? How do we come to understanding equality? How did we do this? Progression. What's our chosen methodology? Parable teaching. <laughs> Parable teaching is the tool that opens up the message. What is their tool that opens up their message? Conspiracy theories. So we have taught about the the need to understand equality, race and gender and conspiracy theories. But all that we're doing when we're saying conspiracy theories is identifying their methodology to come to their wrong conclusion. The testing message is equality purely. What we're identifying with conspiracy theories is the difference between two methodologies. We come to our conclusions in this movement by using a chosen set of rules laid out by God that we can summarize and call parables. They come to their conclusions, whether it's internal or external, by working off what is essentially conspiracy theories. And when I want to talk about conspiracy theories, they can come in different forms. Numerology is one of them. <laughs> that somehow there's this profound meaning because if I add and subtract all of these different random numbers I seem to be able to make a pattern. That's a conspiracy. So their chosen methodology, internal and external, is conspiracy. It is the <coughs> counterpart to our parable teaching. So we come into our history and we find that the midnight cry message in 2018 is what causes the many of Daniel 11.41 to be overthrown and the message is all about equality. The sum of those studies. That is what tests and divides God's people as you would expect of the everlasting gospel. We'll go to Revelation 14, verse 9 and 10 and talk about the three angels' message. Revelation 14, 9 and 10. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without ma ma mixture into the cup of his indignation. So the third angel comes and it says, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark. So the third angel says, If you receive his mark, where? So you can receive the mark in the forehead or
you can receive the mark in the forehead or in the hand. So if we were to think about this, what does it mean to, to receive it in the forehead? And we talked a little bit about that yesterday. If you receive the mark in the forehead, let's just use a, a story we, we know well. If we just talk about Sabbath versus Sunday and you can receive it in the forehead, what does that mean? Doesn't help if you answer in a whisper, can't you? <laughs> if you receive it in your forehead, you're accepting it, aren't you? Yes. You're hearing that message about Sunday and you're choosing to accept it, so you accept. So discernment and acceptance. If you receive it in your hand, do you have to have accepted it? No. What does, what does Satan do? He forces. He says you don't have a choice and people receive it in the hand and they can just receive it in the hand and not the forehead. But by, you cu by the time you come to the, to the end, what have they done? By the time you come to, to the close of probation, you can bet that it's in the forehead. You, cut, you change that from the mark to the seal. If you can receive the mark in the forehead or the hand, where can you receive the seal? Compare and contrast. If the mark can be in the forehead or the hand, the seal can be in the forehead or the hand. So the mark in the forehead or the hand, the seal in the forehead or the hand. So the mark we described as Sunday, the seal, Sabbath keeping. How can you keep the Sabbath, Sabbath in the forehead? You intellectually understand it and accept it. How can you keep it just in the hand? You practice it. And why do you practice it? You practice it because of force. Does God give you a choice? Does God give you a choice whether or not you want to keep Sunday or Saturday? No. If you want to be sealed, it's force. You have to practice it. It's not enough to have it, the intellectual assent to the truth. So the mark can be in the forehead or the hand. You can intellectually choose to keep Sunday because you think it's right or you can do so because you have been forced to. You can receive the seal of God in the forehead because you understand the need to keep Sabbath or you can do so because you feel forced to. By the time you come to the, to the close of probation, to the shut door, if you've received the seal of God only in the hand, what will happen to you? It either has to move into the forehead or you're going to change. Can you see that? If at the Sunday law it's only in the hand and it continues to stay only in the hand and you don't have it, the acceptance in your mind, by the time you come to the shut door, you've either come here or you've come here. Those who have the mark and they're keeping Sunday in the hand, by the time after the Sunday law, people are keeping this mark, the mark of the beast, they can be keeping Sunday in the hand. And then someone comes to them and says, why are you doing that? We have a message that says Saturday is the Sabbath. And then from here, they either move to the forehead and accept Sunday or move to the forehead and accept Sabbath. Does that make sense? So at the beginning, it can be here and here. Satan will force it into the hand. God will force it into our hand. But it does not stay there. By the time the message comes, it either goes into the forehead, a mark on the forehead, or a seal on the forehead. People are either intellectually accepting the message of Sunday or intellectually accepting the message of Sabbath. But does God give a choice as to the practice? No, no choice as to the practice. Whether, it, we, whether we feel that we fully understand it or whether we feel that we 
that it doesn't really make sense to us or whatever we might feel about the Sunday Sabbath issue in the history of the Sunday law, in the history of the Sunday law, it is a salvational issue in practice. If people are keeping Sunday and they require baptism into this movement, would we baptise them? So switch the issues. If it's so easy to see with Sunday and Sabbath, move it to equality. If it's in, if it's in the hand and not in the mind, people are practising equality, but they don't fully understand it, they haven't fully bought into it, but do they have a choice? No choice. <coughs> By the time you get to the close of probation, and remember that we're on a line of progression here too and it's going to continue to be an issue, it has to start working its way into the forehead. But when it comes to the actual practice of it, can we baptise people into this movement that are practising inequality in the home, in the church, in the ministry or fellowship, in the movement? No. If we can't do it for Sabbath, if we take that issue so seriously, why aren't we taking the issue of equality so seriously when it's staring us in the face in our homes, in our ministries and in our movement? We take one seriously and what I see is a failure to take the other one as seriously as we are required to. And when force is applied, people see it as dictatorship. God instituted an organisational structure to make sure that this did not become a choice. And it is not a choice within this movement. Without its practice, we do not recognise ministries, we do not recognise people for baptism any more than we would if a ministry was keeping Sunday, if people were keeping Sunday or advocating either. The practice of it does not become a personal choice. What people need to do is move it from the hand into the forehead. Actually intellectually understand, study it and understand what this message is about, the depth and breadth of this message. It's not all about trousers and so many people think it's about wearing trousers. It's not. That is a, a visible example of the passing of that test. Understanding both the methodology required to understand the message and the message itself. But this is an important issue and we cannot af afford to overlook it because it's going to continue to need to be implemented within this movement. I was speaking to, to some leaders in this movement of a, of a ministry that I won't name earlier this year and they said to me, we love this message, we love those lines, we love the structures, all of these structures of equality, it's so beautiful to look at, we just love it. And I asked those men, how will you feel when that message makes a woman your boss? Dead silence. And one of them turned to me and he said, we will not like that. There's a difference between having some type of liking of the line and recognition that this is intellectually beautiful on a line, an intellectual assent to the truth and putting that intellectual assent into practice. And people who might like the beauty of the lines don't necessarily like them in practice. That's a difficult position we are in this movement right now because many th people think that they've passed the test because they are practicing it. Sorry, because they like the lions, because they like the, the structures, but we are not seeing that practice put into place. And without seeing that practice put into place, this is what God requires. We can't look and see whether or not people really want to keep the Sabbath before we baptise them, but we can see whether or not they're practising Sabbath keeping. That is what we look for. If they're practising it, it's okay. If they're not practising it, it's not okay. And then the organisational structure steps in to remedy that problem. We must take this testing message with the same brevity as we would the mark of the beast in the Sunday Sabbath issue of the Great Controversy. And with that, we must understand that this message is not required to be a theory, but it is required to be practised on three different levels, in the home, in every way, 
in the movement, in the ministry, in the individual ministries, and then, and then in this movement as a government. Without that practice, I don't think we realise how close we are to actually failing the whole test. If we came to the close of probation here, and it was an issue of Sunday versus Sabbath, and we said we like the study, but we're standing here, and we're not yet keeping the Sabbath yet, how do you think we did in the test? We just failed it. And yet we feel good about ourselves because we like the study. Liking the study is not enough. It has to be put into practice in every level. The danger of not is too great and we do not realise the brevity of that. I ended that presentation yesterday with a call to the women of this movement to begin teaching. And it's not just an issue in this country, it's an issue in countries across the world that the not enough women are, are standing up and, and taking up the mantle that was given to them when the midnight cry message was pronounced. This isn't just about personal healing but about who you are and who God raised you up to be. That's meant to be a personal healing message, yes. It's meant to also give you your voice back and it gives you your voice back because God requires you to use it. When I was... When I was little, so high, I only spoke in a very, very low whisper. I had trouble speaking. I'd only ever whisper. And as I grew into my early teens, that became a, 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 real, a really bad problem for me. No one could hear me talk. And my mother took me to a speech therapist. And I spoke to this lady. She said, just speak to me as you would normally speak. And I spoke to her and she said because I know music, she said, do what you just did one octave lower. Do you all know how an octave works? Eight notes. It's, it's on the scale. So she, she had me talk and then she said, say that same sentence one octave lower. And I did that and she said, that, that, that's the level of a normal person's voice. My voice was so high, it was an octave above what was acceptable. And I had so much trouble talking because it was actually physically exhausting to speak and she worked with me and we dealt with some of these issues but I still have I have problems with my voice today I, I croak a lot and you may notice I don't really sing singing is one thing I've never found I can I can do um, just the lung strength to do that some reason talking almost shouting is easier than singing singing requires a strength I, I don't seem to be able to find which is okay because I'm Australian and our singing is notoriously terrible. <laughs> kind of like our running. Um, what, why I mention that is because through, through culture, and by culture I don't just mean Kenyan, I mean conservative Adventists. Conservative Adventism culture requires women to have this low, sweet voice and we're trained with that from the time that we're children. And all of these things that have been trained into us. And Ellen White talks about training the voice. We need to actually take this call seriously and begin that work. We need to train our voices, all of us, but I'm specifically speaking to the women, train our voices, project our voices. And how did Jesus speak? He spoke with one who had authority. And we're trained from the time that we're young as women to speak in little low tones and not to speak as if we have authority because that might upset someone. It's driven into us as Adventists through the culture of conservative Adventism. These things are deep-seated and I know that they're not going to go just in a day or a month or even a year, but that process must begin to happen. And it's only going to happen if we realise that we personally have a work to do to start training our voices, start lifting our voices and start teaching and presenting. When I first went to Arkansas last year, I spoke to Parminda and I was terrified because I said, I'm going to get through one presentation, I'll lose my voice and I won't physically be able to speak. And it did physically hurt to speak, but this year it has strengthened and I know that, I know that it has continued to. I've only lost my voice, I think, twice so far, once, once badly enough, but God has, has taken care of those problems. We have these 
we have these legacy issues of sexism that have been ingrained into us from children. And part of this midnight cry message, it's the lines are beautiful, they're all there to see, but then it also requires a work that's not going to be done in a moment. That's one of the reasons we're not yet ready to go to work. If we were ready to go to work, we would be doing it here. But you must understand that we're not ready. So what's holding us back? There must be things that are still holding us back from being able to fulfill that job function. I would suggest that implementing the message of the midnight cry is one of those things. And while I recognise that we, it takes time to make change. God's already told us the year of Panium and what, what has he essentially said? That's probationary time. That's a time of probation. He's set us a time and said, you have to fix your problems by then. He's not going to extend Panium for us. We have a set period of time by, the, by which we need to have these things that are holding us back dealt with, dealt with properly. And then when we actually do go to the Levites, we can do so with power because we have started to eradicate these legacy issues from our lives, from our personal lives, from the teaching in our ministries and from the organisational structure of this movement. It's not all done just in a presentation on equality. It has to become something that becomes a, a it has to change actually the, the structure and the working of this movement. This is somewhere where people look at these messages, they look at something like equality and they look at what we teach about Donald Trump and world wars and that the issue that I keep, not so much recently but at the very beginning, people kept coming and saying this is all well and good but there's no they won't say morality, but what they're saying is there's no morality in this. This isn't going to change anyone. This is just a line about Donald Trump and who he is. If you understand who Donald Trump is, it changes you because you know who God isn't. These studies that we see as prophetic studies, while we understand the, that, that we do not have a moral message, they have a, a moral change on our own characters. That is the power of prophecy. No moral message that says God loves women is actually going to convince mo a lot of women in the world that God genuinely does care because they have all the quotes that says they're not worth very much. Through prophecy and parable teaching, what sounds like a dull theory can actually be, actually be evident but then they are required to come into our lives and change us. A prophetic message does change us. It changes our character. It changes not just the structure of the movement, but it changes our lives. It's required to do that work, not be an intellectual assent to the truth. What begins as just a, an, an assent in the mind must work its way into the heart. So I appealed yesterday to have women start lifting their voices, training their voices and also beginning to teach within Kenya and within this movement in the areas where that has not begun and the work to encourage them will be ongoing. A, a sister mentioned to me yesterday whether or not we could have some perhaps meeting in our, um, in our dorm rooms in the evening maybe one night this week we could actually meet as women and we could actually start, um, those of you who are willing, actually start to practice and we can have a discussion about what studies you want to present and what you're willing to bring. I only want to, want to help and assist in any way that I can. So this was the sum of the study yesterday and I presented it yesterday because so many people came, there was more people here than there had been before and I thought if I have one chance with the women in this country I'm going to do it now and I hope, I hope that they're willing I hope that they're willing to see that the, this restoration is also requiring them to take up a mantle. We know that the 144,000 do not get a choice, neither do the priests. And while it seems like there are many people in this room, we're talking about how many billion people worldwide. We lead them. And if you think about Africa, I don't know the numbers worldwide, but the numbers of priests in Africa is 
of a significant number to compared to the small groups in the rest of the world. And there are large ministries. We have the Brazilian, we have uh, Le Grand Cree, we have significant ministries. But we are a small number of people and every teacher will be required to lift their voices. So we first of all went through this history of diet so we could show the hypocrisy of those who say they don't agree with dispensationalism and that progressive study of methodology. Everyone does what we lack is consistency and what we need to continue to apply to every area of our lives is the consistency of this methodology. I might close now because I want to move from this back to our study of the world wars and that's going to move us from back to what we left behind uh, Friday evening and perhaps later in the week as needed we can come back to this study and we'll certainly come back uh, to this history and um, and the history of, of this rise of Donald Trump and, the, and this issue of inequality within the United States. If you kneel with me, we'll close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for our blessings. Thank you that you give us these messages. I pray, Lord, that we'll take them as seriously as you desire us to. Lord, we know that, that the only hope of our salvation is to not just have an intellectual assent, Lord, but we must also put it into practice. It's that practice that you require of us. I pray, Lord, that we will not see this as dictatorship. This is the demands that you have placed upon us. May we personally, individually, and as a movement fulfill those requirements as we would any requirement of Sabbath keeping. Lord, I pray that you will inspire us with, um, with, your, with your messages, with your love for us, with the need of those people around us who are, who are dying for lack of knowledge. May we be inspired to reach them in whatever way that we might be able to. Thank you, Lord, for how you have led and guided these last 30 years. And as we go through this last 18-month history of, of refinement, Lord, I pray that we will prepare us for that great work that we know is coming at our Pentecost. Lord, may we not hold back the work that needs to be done. I pray, Lord, that we will be ready. In Jesus' name, amen.